got to say what an honor, what a privilege it is for me to be back here in Charlotte, North Carolina. And I just, I just think the Elevation Church, come on. Anybody thankful that you just go to the greatest church? In fact, uh, I, I was here last week for the worship night. My, my, my. I, I sense a revival coming, man. This place was jam-packed to the ra- I mean, I'm telling you what a tangible sense of God's presence. Anyone get scared when Brandon Lake just did a full crowd surf? I was like, I don't know if we got insurance for that, but... Uh... dude was committed to the cause. You never know what to expect at Elevation Church Worship Night. Hello, Bezel T3. That was Rich Wilkerson Jr. of VU Church in Miami, Florida. Now, I found this little video on their website that encourages all who come to engage in that ancient mystical practice called walking a labyrinth before the worship service. You get there and they bring you through all these mazes, twists, and turns until you get to... As you continue straight, you've entered the auditorium. Walk right in and someone from our host team will direct you to your seat. This is where we worship together and hear an encouraging word from our pastors. Well, this day, that encouraging word won't be from the VU Church Auditorium, but instead will be from Stephen Furtick's Elevation Church Auditorium, where Rich will be speaking on the frustration of expectation. But first, Rich must must gush over his buddy and fellow celebrity pastor, Stephen Furtick. Any chance I get to be up on this stage and any chance I get to brag and give honor where honor is due towards your pastors, I want to make sure I take... I take my chance. Well, sure. And uh, I just want to make sure that I'm uh, I'm being loud and clear that I, I'm aligning myself with what I think is some of the world's greatest leaders in the body of Christ today. Anybody Both want great. some of that Furtick blessing on you? <laughs> now, I wonder if that Furtick blessing includes this. <clears throat> Holly and I made a decision to build a house. It's a big house. Uh, you know, somehow I don't think that the, that a blessing goes that far for people. Now, back to Rich and his frustration with expectation teaching. He will be using Romans 8, chapter, uh, I'm sorry, chapter 8, verses 18 through 27 as the primary passage. But like starting out at a trailhead that begins a very long hike, Rich will not stay there very long. Now, Rich is also a very interactive preacher who apparently needs constant encouragement from those in the audience as well <clears throat> as those online. Today, uh, not just from in the room, but in the chat online, you could say amen. Uh, you could say I like that. You could say preach it, white boy. I don't really care. <laughs> But today, everyone is tapping into their inner Pentecostal. We're going to all verbally engage. Come on. How many believe God loves a loud church? Uh, Maybe. I'm not sure. But be that as it may. With all the necessary parameters in place, Rich now begins his sermon in earnest. Get the Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. I'm just going to read some verses, and then I'm just going to give it to you how God gave it to me. Is that okay? Thank God. Romans chapter 8, verse 18. This is Paul the Apostle. He writes to the church in Rome, and he says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation. Someone say expectation. For the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration. Frustration is a common emotional response related to anger, annoyance, and disappointment. Not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it. In hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. Now, I had a little fun with that, and I, you know... This clip, okay, this, this, this clip, I, I wanted to just, because he makes such a big deal out of those two words, that's why I made a little fun. But seriously, what a great 
word of assurance we have in this passage. And although Rich goes on to read until verse 27, I stopped the reading of Scripture at verse 21. And we'll get back to those, 22 through 27, as we close. So after reading the text, what is the first thing that Rich wants to focus on? I've been married to the same woman for 14 years. Thank God. Uh, we have two beautiful boys. In fact, my oldest son, who's three years of age, his name is Wyatt Wesley Wilkerson. He's actually traveling with me here today to Elevation Church. And uh, my second born son, his name is Wild Wesley Wilkerson. I know these names are a mouthful, you know, WWW are their initials. We call them World Wide Web for short, you know, like... So Rich begins with his family and specifically his younger son, Wild, who apparently likes water a lot. The problem with Wild is he don't know how to swim. And this is like not funny at all. This is like truly scary in my house right now because this boy whose name is Wild is Wild. Literally, the kid is a savage. Um, he thinks it's funny to throw himself into swimming pools. When you pull him out of the water, he is laughing hysterically. You're like, you're sick, bro. <laughs> now, I watched this whole sermon from uh, start to finish, and from time to time, Rich says some really good things. But beginning with such a majestic passage of scripture, and then immediately sharing a three-minute funny story about, um, you know, his, his kid, <laughs> You know, full, full frontal uh, body slams into the water. Well, it betrays either Rich's inadequacy of expositing the text in front of him, or it shows that the text is more of a launching pad for what Rich really wants to share. If you would give me the next 34 minutes of your time, I want to preach to you today from the subject, the frustration of expectation. See, he wants to preach from the subject, not from the text, it, it appears. And so I have to conclude <clears throat> that it is the latter of those two options, that the text is more of a launching pad for what Rich wants to share. Now, Rich will use the text, but notice what he does with it. The Apostle Paul, he writes to the church in Rome, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. He's trying to get the church to get their eyes on something bigger. He's declaring out loud that the entire world is waiting on the church of Jesus Christ to rise up and take her proper position, her proper place, that there's something in us that the world is looking for. I don't think that's what Paul is saying at all. Um, you know, creation is not the world. The word creation here means original formation. And it's used by Mark in chapter 10, verse 6, quoting the words of Jesus when he says, but from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. The world means something, <clears throat> excuse me, slightly different. It's where we get the word cosmos or the orderly arrangement of the universe. But Jesus uses, he uses it in John 15 uh, five times to point to humanity apart from God's grace and a humanity that's hostile towards God. The world wants nothing to do with God or his church. So to say that the world is waiting for the church to rise up and take her proper place, that is something, in the, I should say that there's something in the church that the world is looking for, that is to completely misread what Paul is saying here. I, I was here last week, I, this is just, I, I just 15 years of a ministry that's been touching the world. And if you're not careful, you will get so familiar with this crazy, out of control, radical, freakish move of God that the world has never seen before. What's crazy, freakish, and out of control is that pastors are willing to begin with a text from God's word and think that, like, like Plato, that they can mold it and shape it. And you're just using a couple words, in this case, frustration and expectation, and build a whole other focus around that text and thus become unfaithful to the text of God's word. 
The world is looking for a church. The world is looking for the people of God to rise up. The world is looking for some people to carry a standard who would say, I got expectation. No, that's not correct. You know what the world wants? The world wants the true Christian church gone, snuffed out. Now, even if you don't agree with me uh, that the book of Revelation is a picture or symbol book retelling from seven different angles throughout the book, the time between the first and second comings of Christ, which is the amillennial view, doesn't mean we don't believe in a millennium. <laughs> we believe that we're in the millennium right now. It's a whole other story. <clears throat> and you can get, you can get uh, videos that I've done on that if you want. They're, they're there. You can look them up. But the 11th chapter of Revelation is illustrative of the world's desire for the church. Just, just work with me for a second. Picture for a moment the two witnesses or prophets as symbolizing the church through its gospel pulpit and missionary arms. What does the world want to do to the church there? Well, in Revelation 11, 7 through 10, we read, When the two witnesses have finished their testimony, the beast that comes up from the abyss will wage war with them and will overpower and kill them. Their bodies will lie in the street of the great city, figuratively called Sodom and Egypt, where their Lord was crucified. For three and a half days, you know, a short, very, very, very short period of time, all peoples and tribes and tongues and nations will view their bodies and will not permit them to be laid in a tomb. And those, here it is, those who dwell on the earth will gloat over them and will celebrate and send one another gifts because these two prophets had tormented them. You see, what, what I believe that's showing is that right before the return of Jesus Christ, there is going to be immense persecution. In other words, all who are alive right before the second coming of the Lord can, expense, uh, can, can expect, I should say, immense suffering and persecution from the world. My son Wild, he gets up to that pool deck, he's got a stance. He gets up on his tippy toes, he puts his arms back, he gets his butt back, and he leans in. I felt the Spirit of God tell me to tell some people at Elevation Church, it's tiptoe season around here. It's time for you to lean in. It's time for you to put your arms back. God's getting ready to do that which you've never seen him do before. Come on, church, give him a shout of praise. Give him glory. Okay, again, he's giving a reference to his son Wild, that, that family story that he told at the beginning of his pep talk. And boy, these guys get pumped up. It just amazes me how kind of out of control they get. Now, he says it's tiptoe season at Elevation Church, and you got to lean in because God is getting ready to do something you've never seen him do before. Now, did you notice Stephen Furtick facing the crowd as Rich's uh, official cheerleader? Look. Level up, level up. This week is so much better. I'm chilling, I'm winning, like on another level. Oh. And, and just what is it that God is going to do during this tiptoe season? I came in with expectation. I came in believing there's more. I came in believing he's going to set my family free. I believe that can go in the name of Jesus. Come on, somebody. It's tiptoe season. Tippy toe? I don't think so. You don't like tippy toe? No tippy toe. <laughs> no, no tippy toe. You know, cancer being cured and your family being set free, well, both of those are wonderful things. But is that what Paul, through the superintendence of the Spirit as he wrote this, is that what is being conveyed to the church in Romans chapter 8? I can't even tell you the next part if you don't raise your expectation to believe that your best days are still in front of you. See, he's talking about your best days coming up. Not, he's not talking about the new heavens and the new earth in glory. He's talking about right now. Now, take note right now of how Rich is mostly speaking directly to the camera, to that invisible live stream audience. Those in the seats are kind of second fiddle when it should be exactly the opposite of that. Maybe you're watching right now. Man, have I, have I, am I kind of mailing it in? Am I playing safe? Am I still dreaming? Are my best days really actually in front of me? But then I woke up frustrated. <laughs> and I said, oh, 
I'm still frustrated. And that tells me God is not done with me yet. I am still becoming who he has called me to become. He is still giving me vision. He's still putting expectation on the inside of me. My frustration is an indication that I still have divine expectation. <laughs> wow. All right. They just, the way they move around, you know, just back and forth, it's, it's very disorienting. And is it just me, or do I hear the voice of Joel Osteen uh, as he speaks? Check it out. I am still becoming who he has called me to become. He is still giving me vision. He's still putting expectation on the inside of me. My frustration is an indication that I still have divine expectation. You are coming in to a turnaround season. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> Not according to Rich, Joel. We're coming into a tippy-toe season. And see, the next part that Rich was talking about is you embracing the frustration that comes with each expectation so that you'll get the revelation of the great things that God is calling you to. <sighs> All right, then. Let's cut to the crescendo of this thing, and then let's try to make some sense of the passage at hand. Come on, I came to serve notice on you today that this is your season to jump. Come on, this is your season to dive in. This is your season to swim. Come on, God's doing something bigger. God's doing something better. Come on, where are the saints at today? Come on, lift your hands. Come on, lift your voice. Lift the expectation of this room. Baby, I'm a jump. Baby, I'm going into the unknown. He'll rescue you. He'll be there. He's never failed anyone. He's not going to start with you. Come on, Chris. Sing it out. You know, with all those, you know, excite, ex exciting words and all that, that energy on stage, you know, it's no wonder they pack that place out every single week. The problem with Rich and with Stephen Furtick and Joel Osteen and a host of other mega church pastors out there is that they fail to see the distinction between the already and the not yet, or as Jesus taught about it, this age and the age to come. Now, what do I mean by that? Let's go back to Romans chapter 8, verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time, the already, are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be, the not yet, revealed to us. You see, we live in the already, meaning the Lord Jesus has already come. He lived, gave us his words, and showed us his works he was perfectly righteous and declared to be so by a human judge, Pontius Pilate, and yet was horribly mistreated, tortured as a common criminal and executed at the hands of the Romans at the insistence of the Jewish religious leaders. But death could not hold him, as King David wrote in Psalms. Psalms. <laughs> For you will not abandon my soul to Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to undergo decay. You see, he rose from the dead bodily three days later, appeared to the apostles for a period of 40 days, and then ascended bodily into heaven as those apostles watched him go. We today live in the reality of those historical events. But what does Paul say next? Well, he says, For the eagerly awaiting creation waits for the revealing of the sons and daughters of God. You see, if we go back to Genesis 3, to the fall, we see that not only were curses given to Satan and the woman and the man, but also to all the created order. When God was giving the curses to Adam, he said, Cursed is the ground because of you. Through toil you will eat of it all the days of your life, both thorns and thistles it will yield for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow you will eat bread until you return to the ground, because out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. You see, as man went, you know, rebelling against God, so too creation necessarily followed, because creation was created for man, and it was all created good until the fall. So, even though Christians are saved from God's wrath, which is already present reality, the glory of the age to come is not yet. And that is why Paul says, for the eagerly awaiting creation waits for the revealing of the sons and daughters of God 
before creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will also be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. You see, there are three that groan in this passage, creation, Christians, and the Holy Spirit himself. Now, both creation and the redeemed, you know, mankind who are born again, groan in hope for the return of the Lord Jesus and the ushering in of the new heavens and the new earth. The Holy Spirit groans in a very different way. His groaning for us, it's, it's groaning as he intercedes for us in our weakness as we pray. Because we as Christians, well, we stumble and we bumble through this life, praying oft times puny and very selfish prayers. The Holy Spirit intercedes for us and translates our prayers, as it were, making them acceptable according to the will of the Father. Now, our, our sufferings may seem intense and all-consuming at times, and, and, and at times they actually are. But in comparison to what is coming when the Lord Jesus returns in glory to set all things right, they are, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, light and momentary afflictions that are preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Chapter 8 of Romans begins with that great news that therefore there is now no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. And it ends with that great doxology that should keep every Christian pressing on until that glorious day of Christ's return. That neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Friends, <clears throat> The passage that Rich used in Romans chapter 8 is so vast, so deep, and so wide, so boundless in its encouragement for the Christian that it is not necessary to veer to the left or to the right from the text itself. However, if the pastor wants to focus on the already, you know, now, in other words, this present evil age, as if it's the same as the not yet, you know, the glory of God in the new heavens and the new earth, then as that pastor, you're always going to have to embellish. It's in the unknown that our God makes himself known. And the best days of this house, I just see it. The best days of this house are in front of you.